Hello. How are you all doing? Good. Can you, I, I, I didn't come here to become a professor to be a cheerleader, but can you up the energy? Um, so uh, I'm Professor Ken Chen, and I guess part of my sub roles here is to be your cheerleader, so here I am. Um, how many people here are seniors? <laughs> well, okay, let's cheer, let's cheer for the seniors. In um, and how many of you have existential crises about what you're going to do in a month? <laughs> um, so I think it's good we can come together to support each other in spite of, you know, whatever fear you have about the entire rest of your life, um, which is, after all, what the role of writing is to alleviate that um, anxiety about, you know, mortality, the future, and so on. Um, two things I will say is that um, I'm sure a lot of you are worried about, you know, should I go to grad school? Will I get into this MFA program? Uh, should I become a lawyer like my parents want? Um, you know, what about these people who I deride as sellouts, but who are now getting a consulting job that seems very fancy? And um, what I will say is that you don't actually have to figure out the rest of your life immediately. Uh, you just have to figure out the next thing you're doing. So try to alleviate whatever kind of abstract pressure you have and just do the next thing you have to do. And the other thing I'll say is that your parents will probably love you no matter what it is you decide to do. So just go ahead and do that thing anyways. Um, OK, so I have some thank yous. So first of all, I want to give a shout out uh, for a very special person joining uh, the Barnard faculty, Jhumpa Lahiri over here. So let's give her a hand. Um, as some, many of you know, um, Jhumpa is the new director of creative writing and will be starting in the fall in person teaching two classes. So some of you may be in her class. Um, and I'd also like to give a thanks to Sarah Hilligus, who many of you probably know. <laughs> and has been doing a lot of the heavy lifting um, while I scroll Instagram on my phone. Um, <laughs> So a few other thank yous. So um, thank you to the other creative writing staff, faculty, um, Jenny Boylan, Saskia Hamilton, Hashem Matar. Um, thank you also to all the adjunct instructors who, you know, if you've taken a creative writing course, it's very likely been with them, and they're irreplaceable. Um, thank you to the chair of English, Peter Platt, um, and the administrators, Sarah Pasadena and Julissa Acosta. And thank you for the events and AV staff as well. Um, okay, so we're here to celebrate all the senior creative writing concentrators. So um, I'll come up in between each reader and say something vaguely sentimental. And um, uh, but please try to be supportive for all your readers. And uh, the readers, please be short. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, our so it's also surreal to see many of you who are my students in masks because it's almost like. Like we had season two of our TV show, and you were all recast by like different <laughs> actors, so it's a little surreal. Um, okay, so first, I'm excited uh, to introduce Ellie George. Um, so, um, I think out of all the, not I'm not going to make comparisons, but um, I, I was struck by how much Ellie grew in our senior sem senior project class last semester in that. And I think what drove her growth was uh, she really had a story she needed to tell, which is a story of uh, kind of coming from a blue collar family and finding out what it means to write about class uh, and write a kind of proletarian literature, which is very important in our world of literary class segregation. Let's give a hand for Ellie. Hey guys, um, this is an excerpt from a story I wrote called The Ritual, and we're starting um, like towards the end of the story, so those who haven't heard previous iterations, sorry. Okay. The chiefs were seriously tanking. Our meals appeared along with Dad's second drink, just in time to see the running back fumble the ball and the Patriots take off in the opposite direction. Dad took a bite, a swig, then announced, I'll let you know, Lolo, that I did get an interview for one last job, 
right here in Wichita. What would you be doing, I asked, stabbing at the greens on my veggie platter with my fork, building metal trusses. Interesting, do you know how to build metal trusses? Nope, he stated, matter-of-factly, but guess how much it pays. He didn't wait for my response and then thudded the table again with his fist. 30 an hour, just like you. They'll even train me. I couldn't tell if his, this was a joke or not, so I offered a neutral response of generic encouragement. Wow, but dad kept going. Dunno why I even tried to become a teacher in the first place, he said with the same tone of over-exaggerated disbelief. Inklings of fright registered with me now. His eyes stayed wide open, eyebrows sky high. Was he drunk? I responded with what I believed to be an innocent reply. Well, maybe you should just watch a YouTube video on how to build them or something. With that, my father erupted into laughter. He hammered the table like this line was the funniest thing he had heard in years. Yeah, maybe I should. He raised his voice louder. Maybe I should just watch a video. He laughed and laughed. Red hot embarrassment rippled over me. I could feel the stares from the other guests as they yet again swiveled their heads in our direction. I concentrated on the two remaining sticks of celery on my plate, pretending my eyes could shoot lasers and trace along the sticks' ridges. My gaze remained cast downward until I heard his giggle fits dissipate into a series of shallow, low, quick breaths. Good one, Lolo. Real good, he sighed, exhausted. An hour later, dinner commenced. The waitress returned to our table and presented the check. It laid out in front of us on the table. The print was too small for me to see the numbers, but I could feel the weight of it in the pit of my stomach. Since his fit of laughter, Dad ordered a side of fries, dessert, and a glass of wine. I didn't eat a single bite. Let me get it, I offered. No, no, Dad objected, shaking his head. We're celebrating you, remember? No, really, here, I said, reaching into my pocket. Dad, too, tried to fish out his own wallet, but I had already beaten him. The waitress accepted my card, and Dad watched her retreat back to the kitchen. When she disappeared, he turned to me with his eyebrows scrunched together, mouth firmly pressed into a scowl. It was his tone that surprised me. Why'd you do that, Lolo? He asked softly, his words coming from the back of his throat. I didn't know how to respond. In the parking lot, I followed Dad two steps behind him. It was a typical cold December evening in Wichita, but I got the impression that the temperature wasn't the reason for his brisk pace. Just before Dad went to unlock the car door, he shouted over his shoulder, I'm trying to see if I can find the rest of the game on the radio. That's when I saw the shiny glint of car keys as they emerged from his pocket. Dad, let me drive. But Dad retracted his hands immediately, clutching the keys close. No, you've had a lot to drink. I'm fine, and you haven't driven since... Since when, exactly? He had a point. In DC, the public transit system was good enough that I didn't need to own a car, meaning I haven't driven since I left home for college six years ago. I know, but Dad, please. I'm the driver. Dad, no, I told you. He shoved the keys into the lock. But before taking his seat behind the wheel, he turned to me once more. I'm the driver. Thank you. <laughs> Um, next, I'm excited to introduce Lauren Oberwatcher, who um, is, I feel like, a, a resident beatnik, and I feel like everyone in the class was um, irradiated by the psychedelic aura of her writing. Let's give her a hand. Um, a little fun, yeah. Sometimes I, um, I think that the realist experiences are the ones that sound fake. So um, this is from a collection of 10 shorts, and they are written like they're on a trip, is the, so, but not really. Um, uh, uh, other stories were the ones about finding God. Nerves growing three inches from your skin, listening to the ghosts of leaves and watching their dance routines. So, playing with fiction, this is a voice memo by Grace Goldenhair Jones. When I lived with my mother, I liked the word morning. I liked the way it cleaved. Though I didn't know that then, then I was thinking of my sister in the morning she left, or probably vaguer. I was a kid and I thought all funerals were supposed to take place before noon. And so I was sitting there in the officially chilly part of fall, standing in line for the Natural History Museum because I read someone doing that somewhere, maybe in a book. Starting when I 
picked up piano, but I wasn't very good because I couldn't read music. So I thought about how I'd make up my own songs and make up my own songs to remember them. We had left the cafe and I, where I ordered a salad that was walnuts. It was just full of walnuts. It was lettuce and walnuts, and it was so perfect, a little salad of nutty brains. And so right there, right there beneath the picture of Edgar Allan Poe, a huge photo of Edgar Allan Poe, we squeezed the lemons, and then we were outside again, and it was really cold. But I calmed down, myself down, thinking of Grace as young Grace. Grace did this, Grace did that. Grace is looking forward to the planetarium. Grace could have turned out even better if she knew how to listen to music. A visual of taxi cabs, I instead became fixated on my bendable str straw and how it matched a pair of sweatpants, juicy knockoffs. I used to have them. Well, I used to fit into them. I still have them, but I thought about the patterned shirt I changed into every time my brother was mean. I became nervous, itchy, thinking of mornings and mornings and the ease at which I saw my mother's grief. We had to stand in line for so long, it was, watching, it was like watching a pot boil. I felt my backpack on my shoulders and I didn't want to feel burdened by anything, so I took it off once inside and I turned in, tuned into that playlist Eve told me about and it started with this one song she showed me and I thought of my best friend Finley. I had a best friend Finley and I would be at her house all the time and I loved it there and I wanted to be, well, I was part of her family since I was a baby because they would do the best things. One time her mom, her mom had cans of Coca-Cola in the back of her car and one summer all these cans. We found them cold in the hot truck so we got vanilla ice cream from the freezer, picked out large scoops and we were seven or eight sitting in the back of the car drinking cold Coca-Cola and vanilla ice cream all day. But then we were 12 and 13 and my sister had messed up and then our moms got into a fight and we weren't friends anymore. We talked a little bit over the years. I would try, but I haven't tried. I haven't tried yet. And then we were kind of friends. And then my sister got kicked out of school, and I saw my mother being mad at my sister for things she couldn't control, but she couldn't control them. But my mother wouldn't get frustrated. In the end, she would just get sad, really, really sad, to really, really mad, and back again. And then I got so mad at my sister because she made, or I thought she made my mom so mad. I thought she made my mom a monster. So I thought she made my mom into a monster. I thought that that's how it worked. Do you believe in monsters, doctor? Doctor, do you believe in ghosts? I wanted to imagine goblins rising from the hair in the sink and coming up to clean. I had an orange in my room that my therapist told me to freeze. I brought it into the shower and rested it between my chest and my knees. From what I can remember, I don't have dreams, but sometimes I experiment, experiment with thinking in third person. So then I got out of the shower and took a shower again, but in another stall so that it felt like a shower. And I heard the music of my towel and the other towel, but what meanings did the towel have? Nothing. I mean, nothing. But Grace could see the towels and their music, and then I couldn't narrate anymore. I felt, I don't know what I felt, but I couldn't do it and I couldn't do that anymore. And if anything else comes up, I'll record another. But if not, I'll see you next week. Or either way, I'll see you next week. Oh, actually, wait, you'll like this one. I'm sure you've read Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I remember reading that book. Once, all that happened was someone opened a window, and I jumped. And I jumped, and it was scary, and I jumped just because of how it was written, and it was so good, you know? I actually, I think it's my favorite book, but it sounded more impressive back then, when the little girl with curly hair told the adults his adults' his friends that people can be multifaceted. Alas, I'll see you next week. What many of us noticed about Meg Young's writing was the way that she's a fiction writer, but one interested in a kind of abstraction of form, uh, a kind of form as a minimalist mode different from plot or character. Let's give a hand to Meg. Hi. Um, so I'm going to be reading the last four pages of a longer piece. It's kind of when everything starts coming together, so it might be a little confusing um, if you haven't read the rest, but hopefully still enjoyable. You're in an endless pool of shadow, pores of white winking somewhere too far for the light to touch you. Things come to you floating, no gravity here. A glass of water with a torn up Hallmark card inside, get well soon, dissolving into mush. Spill and watch it spin into globules, watch them tumble down. The windows, windows of your childhood home, you haven't seen them in so long, but they're opaque, they're closed mouths. Then the windows of your hospital room, tear away the curtains, rip them off the walls, catapult yourself through the glass, demolishing with your muscle and bone, 
Feel the shards as they puncture you and the bruises forming on impact. Your arms slick with blood and the blood breathing. You breathing, leaping from the window. In midair, the blood dissipates and you are back in the shadow again. A matchstick rises from below, pricking the callus on your heel. When was the last time you had a callus on your heel and it sparks but refuses to catch flame? Perhaps there is no oxygen in this place. It is not needed. Your hair on your head and your upper lip and your shins and between your legs flushes out and immerses everything. Soft, fluffy, protected. So much hair, it blocks your vision, covers your mouth, orbits all around. And then somehow it evaporates. You are naked, but comfortably, like a fetus, like a Russian doll, life inside life inside life. Words are delivered from the outside and snatches, spoken through the mouths of the objects. A house sparrow swings down and tells you with its stumpy black beak that it is almost time, flashing its nape before cascading away. Collections of board games you once played with your cousins, hundreds of them, tumble down a set of stairs and pop open. Their dice and chits and miniatures crash out and form a hard clatter, which forms syllables, which form a long sentence you translate in real time. It is something about signatures and paperwork and some other words you have never heard before. You survey each part of your body, fingers and toes, scalp, spine, breast, kneecap. Your earlobe, you decide, is your favorite one. Suddenly, the abyss opens and you run, sprint through dunes of warm, bright sand, it rushes between your toes, and a few grains fly into your eyes, but you feel alive, and so you cannot care. The sand becomes mountains, then tall skyscrapers, then an expanse of rock piles. You are exhausted in a way you forgot you could be. You are glad to be wherever it is that you are. I am euphoric until I am entering somewhere similar, and it is not so peaceful. I see things I cannot seem to escape, like the missed calls popping up from my dad on my phone, the low metallic hum of the operating room, somehow permeating my sleep, or the blank look on your body's washed out face, how without any expression you look nothing like yourself. I am in the sky instead of a shadow. Instead of objects, there are places. Your family's backyard before a storm, the imminent thunderclap traveling through time to squall at me, something about forceps, the bathroom of my kindergarten classroom, and I am peeing, watching a portrait of a dancing pig with a bowler hat as it winks through the frame's glass. A giggle escapes me, but it is the kind of giggle one hears from the empty corner of a too big room in the night. It is the kind of sound one runs away from. Around me, there rise undefined forms, the color of dry beans and seaweed, pressing against me like giant balloons. I feel as though I may suffocate, and then they recede. They sharpen into distinct shapes. They are memories, your memories. They begin in the last few weeks, the ones I have already recounted, and suddenly they accelerate backward, your first time getting drunk, how you truly hated kissing when you were 13, the time you tried an oyster and spat it onto the table in the middle of a restaurant, the day we met as tiny children, the specific feeling of nostalgic glee and terror you get when you duck beneath a big wave at the beach, each memory is a single frame and a reel, and they flip by almost before I can make them out. But as they move, I am watching your life, and it makes perfect sense. I am living it with you all over again. It happens so fast, over before I can even have another thought. Now I find myself in a parking lot. My dad's hands are resting on my shoulders, balancing me on a bicycle and pushing me along. We pick up more speed, my knuckles white with grip, and he lets go without warning. To my surprise, I do not tip over and crack open my skull, but instead continue to glide. I fly. My dad cheers and chuckles somewhere behind me. I turn to see his goofy grin, but all I find is a random man with a smile. I squeeze the brakes, and then the parking lot is completely empty. The bicycle disappears. My memories do not sit by side, side by side with yours, not like they promised. They slip. There are ever more things I cannot recognize, faces I cannot place. I cannot tell you where I went to college or the address of the house I grew up in, whether or not I ever have owned a pet. I cannot tell you if I am even here. In flashes, wet grass, earthworms poking their heads through the surface of the soil, an invisible sun cloaked behind clouds and ringing like a bell. 
I have not seen these things before and cannot tell you why they have been brought to me. I get the feeling that I am supposed to know, that perhaps I once did. But I understand new things, like the pull of the dance floor in a crowded room. I experience becoming antsy and craving people I have never met, the desire to leave old things behind. I know what it is to yearn for every place I have never been, to have money and go on vacation with my family each summer. I think about how I still kind of like my old body, even if it is hardly there, and how wherever I am now does not feel like home. The haze begins to melt away, and I hear the people around me, curtains opening and watery coffee smacking on lips. My eyelids lift, and my mother and father are watching me, standing in a rare embrace, and I hear my own voice, finally, for the first time. So I only met Sarah Rosen 15 minutes ago, but um, there are two facts you should know. One is that she's a great screenwriter. Number two, at a recent faculty meeting, Professor Asa Gabori said she's an amazing person, student, and scholar. Let's give her a hand. Um, this is from a nonfiction piece that I like realized it was too long, so I cut out chunks in the middle, so it's all really um, everywhere, but that's okay. Um, okay. There's a mother, smiling as she carefully combs her daughter's hair. The brush moves smoothly over the heights and ridges of her skull, and she's careful not to tug out a strand. The daughter closes her eyes because she knows her mother is the one behind her, with her hands on her back, and she's safe, and she feels a sort of nice massage from the bristles of the brush. Her mother goes slower over the knots. There's an old man eating dinner alone at his favorite table at the restaurant near his walk-up apartment. Every movement is painfully slow, and you wonder how hard he's breathing over there, how many knees he's had replaced, how often his grandchildren come by, if he has any. You hope he has some. <clears throat> the waitress touches his shoulder, hunching a little, so her voice travels faster to the inside of his hairy ear. And she says, with a smile, of course, the usual Jeff, he's been coming here for years alone. There's a girl, around 21, listening to her friend talk about her summer. Her friend begins to cry all of a sudden, break down in these kind of unrelenting sobs that she can't seem to quiet down. She was in Europe with another friend, and they got on a boat with some boys, and as the night wore on, she got drunker and drunker. Something bad happened. The girl listening, <coughs> now in a room with her months later, feels t tears begin to sting at her own eyes, too, and she shakes her head, telling her friend that she's okay now, that she's so sorry. She thought for a minute that she would find this man, she should find this man, she should murder him, she should really murder him. Her friend rocks and cries and seems to collapse, uncertain of herself and her feelings, but mostly knowing she was, she's profoundly terrified. Terrified she's never going to escape this, never feel the same that she used to. But now she has a friend holding her. And she's not alone in this moment, not in that room or on that boat anymore. And so they cry together, and they don't stop until they feel, feel, fall asleep exactly like that. My mother says the word tender quite a lot, and I've never exactly known what she means. It feels specific and intentional, a word that you can say only because you mean it because there's a warmth inside of you that a moment brings on, or a piece of writing or art or something that catches your eye. My mother explains it as something more than sensitive, like when somebody's telling you something and you respond to them with sympathy or care, maybe caution too. Definitely caution, she says. She thinks of her patients, her friends, when they're telling her a story, maybe a problem that's bothering them, and how they look at her and she looks back and she responds not critically and not logically or helpfully, but with a kind of careful love that's delicate and that's for the other person completely. Tenderness, she believes, is a way of reacting. But perhaps tenderness is bigger than a responsive technique. Its definition can be multiple and elusive. It can vary. Isn't tender like my boobs on my period, a friend says? Isn't it like when you like don't put meat on the barbecue for too long, said another? Isn't it like <clears throat> the nicest feeling in the world, like when you are really comfortable with someone and like it's dimly lit or something? Um, it's like when something can hurt you, like when you're sensitive and vulnerable, so it's like a tender area or whatever, and yeah. A Google search shows all of these definitions to be true. My mother's on top. There's A, showing gentleness and concern or sympathy. Two, of food, easy to cut or chew, not tough. Three, of body, sensitive to pain. Four, young, immature, and vulnerable. It seems that tenderness is multiple and elusive. But none of these definitions are necessarily that different from each other. But perhaps more accurately, they all work together to imagine a grander kind of tenderness, one that exists in the larger atmosphere of life, so much so that it's intangible, and though it's directly in front of you. So tenderness can be a mother sitting behind her daughter, brushing her hair so diligently so as not to cause her even the most insignificant amount of pain, and her daughter breathing a little noisily, like kids do, 
scared she'll forget to breathe and suffocate and die, even though an urgent care doctor says that doesn't happen. The daughter here has a bad case of hypochondria, um, and she's terribly afraid of head injuries. The daughter won't sleep anymore because she knows, as she believes every child should, that going to sleep with a head injury is a death sentence. And so her mother has been staying awake with her every night until she falls shakily to sleep. They watch Hannah Montana until 5 a.m. most nights as the mother's eyes close and quickly open to the urgent tug of her daughter's small, soft hand. Do you just fall asleep, the daughter will ask? No, no, I just close my eyes for a second. She sits upright so her daughter will never have to think she's alone, alone in her wakefulness, alone on the couch, alone in the world in the craziness of her own head. She sits upright so that her daughter's eyes can close because she feels safe here, because her mother has chosen to love her carefully, tenderly. This daughter will go on to remember her mother these nights with a feeling in her heart that she calls tenderness because her mother gave her, the, the, her mother gave her that joy and that privilege of being treated with someone, treated with the utmost care and delicacy that she believes up until she is around 18, that tenderness is an act that happens, not one that her mother has carefully created. Tenderness is at a restaurant where an old man with blue veins that run through his neck and wrists and calves orders his usual, and his name is Jeff, and it's Christmas, and he's alone. But you, also there, are Jewish, and it's Chinese with your family, so it's okay. But he's alone, he comes there a lot, and he likes to go about once a week, on Tuesdays most often, unless something else comes up, to treat himself to a nice dinner, because he likes the place, and he doesn't like being alone in his apartment. He used to walk up, <coughs> up the stairs to his apartment with his wife, but now that apartment has leaks in the bottom of nearly every sink, and him and his wife would clutch, clutch onto you onto each other's arms to get there. Sometimes she'd be holding bags of groceries and he'd take them for her on the top of the first staircase because he'd realize she needed help and that her lungs weren't so good anymore and weren't her arms getting awfully skinny. The waitress touches his shoulder and she looks at him like she would a father and he looks back at her smiling and jolted back into the real world that he so often forgets about. That seems almost secondary to the lives of the memories in his head and his imagination. <clears throat> he pats her hand, the one that was on his shoulder, and this is an agile move for him. He returns a feeling and you're viewing an act of tenderness in a raw, hot form that's strong enough to reach over and touch you, pulling you into the space of, feel of the feeling created by a waitress and a man about whom you've fabricated a story in your head. Tenderness is a conversation in a dimly lit room where two friends are talking about their summers and there's an, ex there's an explosion within one of them. This one is taller than the other and has always been more stoic. She's not the one who feels things intensely, but rather carefully and cynically. She hates when people make big deals of things and prefers to keep whatever she can, in can inside, but she's always aware of herself. Now she realizes she hasn't been aware of herself in, for months because if she had, she'd never be able to live. She was used to shitty boys and shitty sex, but she wasn't used to that. She didn't know how to carry it with her and she'd never been more afraid of it in her life because for the first time she wasn't sure she could carry something so utterly heavy and what would happen if she couldn't. Her friend tells her she doesn't have to right now. She's carrying it right with her and she'll take as much of the weight as she can and as much of anything as she can and they can live on autopilot when they needed to and cry and scream when they need to. If she's stuck, the other, her friend would help She'd never be alone, she promised, and so the friend sleeps in bed with her every night for the next month. And she goes to therapy for a while, and when she's older and they're out of college, she looks back on those nights, just like the little girl looked back on those nights with her mother, and she feels a hand squeeze her heart. She almost wants to yell because she loves her friend, and she knows her friend had loved her carefully and delicately and strongly during that time. It must be then that tenderness is a feeling, but it's a carefully crafted one. It involves all definitions shared by friends and by moments. Tenderness is born from an individual, one who shows gentleness and something more than sensitivity and caring for someone. It comes when someone is sensitive to pain, maybe young and vulnerable, maybe requiring someone to care for them and carry their lives for them while they cannot lift their own arms. It's a responsive technique and it's also a state of being in pain and vulnerable. It's safe and warm and dimly lit and it's larger than those involved. Large enough for people to live in for a few moments and be warmed. So whenever Camila Marchese would hand in a short story, I feel like those of us reading it would bask in the sensory richness of her world, a world of salt and sea urchins, mothers and daughters. Uh, uh, and please give her a hand. Thank you. Um, this is an excerpt of the long story that I'm writing, and these are the first couple of pages, so enjoy, I guess. Um, Sicilia, Agosto, 1970, Sicily, August, 1970. I stared at my father as he sat capotavola. He stood there silently while the rest of the table talked loudly over each other. He tapped his fingers rhythmically along the tunes of an old song without saying a single wor word. Tap, 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 tap. His fingertips were having a conversation with the flower-designed plastic tablecloth. My mother's voice filled in his silence. 
She talked across the table, her voice got louder. She laughed at one of my uncle's jokes and complained about the new stories, stores at the end of the street. My father looked at me as I sat at the children's table, but he didn't smile. He had assembled the tables in the garden and taken out the old plastic white chairs stored in the attic. I got the one with the crooked leg, tilting me to the side as I tried to eat my mom's food. My older brother Marco sat, sat next to me and played with our younger cousins. He was wearing a paper mache hat. We made it that afternoon. I stole some of the yellow crunchy paper that my mother used to wrap the flowers she picked up that morning. Marco took the paper hat from his head and put it on mine. He gave his whole attention to my little cousins as they all tried to build a castle with used plastic cups. My father looked at my brother with the same black expression. He turned towards my aunts and uncles and started mumbling the lyrics of an old song. The table was filled with my mother's cooking, pasta fresca, fresh tomato salad, and arancini. Hands continued to grab the food on the table, creating their own conversation with the multiple appetizers and drinks in front of them. In contrast, the children's table was filled with small plates assembled by our mothers. My younger cousins played with olive pits and used napkins. Their mothers came every once in a while, making sure they finished their food. Marco and I talked played with the wine, and played with the wine corks that we stole from the adults' table. We were in that odd age, too old to sit amongst the toddlers and five-year-olds, but not allowed to sit with the grown-ups. With our hunched bodies sitting on the plastic chairs, I kept my attention towards the other table. I observed how my aunt pulled her hair up in a swirled bun as my uncle squeezed her shoulder. I checked the way our neighbor Pino cleaned his teeth behind his handkerchief. I sensed how their chattering got louder in crescendo as the content in the wine bottle decreased. I could hear my father whispering the lyrics of the song, slowly muffling the words as the conversations happening around them consumed the space. Con le labra due di zucchero, he sang. My mother smiled at him warmly. She grabbed his hands tightly. He pulled back to continue tapping on the table. I could feel my mother's gaze on him, now cold and distant, before she stood up from the table and went back inside. She took his wine bottle back to the kitchen, but he grabbed the one on the other side of the table. His, his fingers grasped the cold and sweating surface of the rain wine bottle and caressed it. My mother's hand laid next to his, but he didn't reach towards it. My mother stood up multiple times during dinner and brought more food each time. My dad poured more wine and my aunts and uncles kept talking about the family members that weren't there that night. It was my mother's birthday, but it seemed as if she was celebrating everyone but herself. She had dressed me up that afternoon with a dress she sewed with the fabrics of a skirt she once wore. She put it on my small body and looked at her creation with admiration. You see, Lisa, it is beautiful, she said, looking directly at the dress. The satisfaction that filled her eyes slowly faded away as she stared into my own eyes. She quickly fixed my hair and I could see her looking at herself in the mirror. My mother's eyes had a stronger effect than the words that left her mouth. I had witnessed, witnessed the slow evolution of the way she glanced at my father, depending on the night and his behavior. Tonight, her eyes laid on him, looking past him. I had learned to decode each one of her looks, the difference between the one she gave my the one she gave my brother, filled with tender delight, and the one she gave me. It was subtle, but we both noticed. Everyone said I had her eyes, hazelnut, round eyes, but mine liked the effect that hers had. Whenever I looked at myself in the mirror, I was somewhat grateful for that. By the time that my mother passed the fruit and my aunt Anna brought the pasticcini, Jenny popped by with his blue bicycle by his side. The sun was setting as the dinner came to an end. He fit his small face between the bars of our fence as he called for my brother. Johnny was 10, my brother's age, but he had the confidence of someone who had lived and walked on the streets of our small town for many more years. His voice was recognized all over town, professors dreaded him, his classmates relied on his jokes for daily entertainment. Older girls stared at him for longer than they should have. I saw him every day, play, every Friday, playing cards with the old man outside of the Circoletto, his skinny hands shoveling the deck of cards. The older men cursed under their breath as they handed him their lire while they smoked cigars and drank wines older than him. Gianni, vieni, vieni, Marco said, excited to greet his friend and leave our younger cousins behind. Gianni entered and hugged him. He threw his bike next to the entrance and walked towards me. He said hi before grabbing a small casata, casata and putting it in his mouth. He looked around and said hi to everyone. An echoing of how are you, how are, how's your mom, how's your dad, greeted him from all sides of the table. 
My father smiled at Johnny and smacked his head jokingly. Johnny walked around the table, grabbing prosciutto and cheese, moving around the adults as if he, as if he were one of them. After, their, another, after another round of wine, my parents, my aunts, and uncles went inside the house. The three of us stayed in the backyard, sitting at the now empty ad adult table. Jenny picked a leftover cigarette butt and lit it up, using one of the candles inside of the Chianti bottle. He sat capotavolo and my brother and I sat next to him. I put my hair up like my aunt did and played with her, with her empty wine glass stained with her lipstick. Jenny's white t-shirt was getting damp with sweat. The stiffness of the hot, humid air filled the space. It was a type of humidity that consumes your body and energy. I could tell that him and my brother were getting bored, but I didn't want the night to come to an end. I know a little game that we can play, I said. I grabbed Johnny's hand and he grabbed my brother's. We sat under the small table by the, by the bushes at the other end of the backyard. This was the small wooden table that my father always used to display his collection of wine, grappa, and limoncello, limoncello bottles that were meant to be consumed by the members of our family. I grabbed one of the bottles and unscrewed it, filling the bottle cap with the yellow liquid. Johnny drank the limoncello as it was water. Um, the sweetness of the fermented liquid caressed the edges of my throat. I left out a soft sigh, gasping for air as my insides steamed up with the leftovers of alcohol in my system. My brother looked at me just like my mother did. His eyes were cold. Hesitantly, he unscrewed my grandfather's grappa and drank directly from the bottle. We sat under the table, our bodies laying one on top of the other. I can feel the skin of my arms tingling, I said, laughing softly. Marco and Johnny grabbed me and tickled me. We all reached towards someone else's arm, hair, or neck. My mom came back to the backyard to clear the table. My screaming laugh laughter caught her attention and she ran towards us. What are you doing, she said. The three of us stood up, mumbling words without actually saying anything. She looked at me and grabbed me by my arms. Her face turned red when she looked at my dress. It was stained with limoncello and some of the tomato sauce she had made that morning. The liquids had merged together on the fabric, creating an orange stain the size of a bottle cap. She liked at the three of us, and I knew the night had come to an end. Thank you. So Abigail Duclos was kind of the entrepreneur of the class, which is maybe unsurprising given that she's had to put on her own plays. And uh, during the class, I think all the students could feel the energy of the conflict in her stories and the psychodynamics and erotics of female friendship. Let's give her a hand. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Abigail. Um, before anything else, I would like to start with a trigger warning for discussions of statutory sexual assault in this. And so if you need to step out or just zone out, knock your socks off. So this is a monologue from a play I wrote last semester called Camp Caddy Wampus. The play is about a group of girls at a summer camp reeling from the recent mysterious death of a close friend of theirs whose name was Maisie. And the monologue is from Poppy, a 15-year-old girl and um, a musical theater kid. Okay. <laughs> There was this girl I knew two years ago. She had a parasite growing inside of her. Like, have you ever seen those documentaries about people who swim naked in the Amazon River with like paper cuts or something because they're stupid idiots and the wor little wormy creatures like crawl into their cuts or like up their thingies? Anywho, this girl, this young maiden, her name was Beth Rorenstein and there was a parasite growing inside of her. And after a few months, you could see it wiggling under her stomach and, okay, so some of the girls said that Marcus Blake put it there, but Marcus said that the parasite wasn't because of him, that it was because of someone else. And everyone believed him because Marcus Blake was a counselor and Beth was just some girl. Anyway, I never saw Beth again. She didn't come back to camp the next summer, but Marcus Blake came back. And the next summer, he got really hot. Like, even hotter than he already was, which was already super freaking hot. And when people saw how super freaking hot Marcus Blake was, they kind of forgot about Beth. Because Marcus had, like, really floppy brown hair and, like, the bluest of blue eyes. Like, his eyes were the exact color of the lake over off of Shepherd's Cliff. Um, <sighs> sorry. Um, there was this girl I knew. Her name was Beth, 
and she had a parasite growing inside of her. She told me about it a couple of weeks into camp because I've always been the best at keeping secrets and everybody knows that. And after a few more weeks, Beth said she could start to feel the little parasite's heart beating. Beth never wore shoes because she said they restricted her feet and she didn't want to get ugly bunions like her mom. So she probably stepped on a gross slimy rock and got the parasite that way. But then, <laughs> sorry, is this not interesting to you? Would you rather me sing Defying Gravity for you? Because I can, but I'm not going to. Unless. <laughs> Your loss, okay? <sighs> there was this girl I knew before. Her name was Beth, and she had a parasite growing inside of her. And if you really want to know, I think that, that Marcus Blake put that same kind of wormy little creature inside of our Maisie. I think he laid her down on his big soft mattress in his big counselor cabin, and I think he put one inside of her and it started growing and growing and it didn't stop and then he got scared because he knew that people would find out, find out just like they found out about Beth. And Maisie's parents were super big Jesus freaks so he knew he couldn't get rid of it with ivermectin or dewormer or whatever. He knew her parents would make her keep the little worm even though she was 15 years old because that's what Jesus would want. But he knew that if that happened he would probably get arrested because you can't put parasites into 15-year-old girls when you're 20 and not expect to get arrested. Maisie was 15 years old. Olive keeps on telling me that she probably tripped and fell and that it was an accident, and that's, that's what happened, but, but Maisie was 15 years old, and now she's no years old because she's dead. Marcus was scared of what would happen if people find out about how, they used to, about how he used to lay Maisie down on his mattress. And, and why wasn't I the one he laid down in his stupid counselor cabin? He had the floppiest brown hair and the bluest of blue eyes, and I used to fall asleep thinking about him pushing me down onto that mattress, about him taking off my clothes like I was the most beautiful thing in the whole entire world, and I wouldn't have gotten a stupid, ugly Amazon River parasite inside of me because someone on the internet told me about condoms once. And, um, but I think he took Maisie instead, just like he took Beth. And I think he took her up to the top of Shepherd's Cliff and he laid her down one last time and afterwards he pushed her off. And she cracked her head open on the rocks below and she died. Maisie died because of him. Maisie died because Marcus Blake was scared of a stupid fucking parasite. That's what I think. That's what I think. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Abigail. Okay, we have our first poet of the night. Um, so uh, when Alex Nakahira would read her poems, it was almost like an experience of seeing telekinesis and that she would create these sort of astral systems out of thin air, uh, kind of welded together from the lesbian politics of Monique Wittig, her own interest in astrological strata and grunge music. Um, let's give Alex a hand. Um, I'm just going to read one poem. And it is titled, its title is a question. Do things get better with accuracy? Also, can everyone hear me? Okay, good. <laughs> Do things get better with accuracy? The querent asks a question only a scientific revolution can answer. The question concerns a cardinal square, a martial Venus proposing to a Venusian Saturn. Ruler of the 10th and the 9th declares, I love you. Stupid martial Venus, so quick to kneel and command. Wait for the eye to recognize the clouds forming. Watch the red birds pierce circles of air. Listen to the tiled Avery sing. Something is always leaving. Matter moves tentatively, skin knocks against blood, 
Integers tessellate in rows. Symmetrical folds rest into another realm, another room, another crowd, another cage. Ruler of the seventh and the tenth lays down. I do not love you, though it could love you. Accuracy has nothing against speed, sweet, alienated Saturn. Structure your hold, whittle down your bones, build a city from multiple bodies, trace the lation between us. Thin, desperate lines, oblique lines and ancient ticks, cardinal squares across our skin. A cradle which does not frame us kindly, a red bird stuck in your rib cage, a locket holding your right eye. It is cold underneath the structure. The querent wants an answer. The question is inside a revolution. Answers begin to tremble. The scene of flight cracks like marbles. Glass arranges in footprints. Things are leaving, things are left out. There are things to scream into, but the moon is void. Everything you ask is without substance and impossible. I'm excited to introduce Daria Subcambardina. <laughs> Had to load up your momentum before. Um, so Daria's work is provocative, profane, and unapologetically erotic. And in addition to the courage required to write this kind of testimony, I think it's worth looking what's underneath that profane surface, which I think is a kind of existential confessional writing um, that asks, what does it mean to be a person in relationship to another person? Let's give a hand to Daria. Hello. My name is Daria. I'm a bit of a shy and shaky person who forgets how to breathe sometimes, so please be patient with me. <laughs> I am reckoning with the reality that I share my body with ordinary men. What is so scary about ordinariness, I struggle to place. Sometimes I badly coveted. I wince at flashbacks of encouraging a boy who doesn't care for me to come in my mouth and pray that I am ordinary, not freakish. I pray that my promiscuity, if depraved, is an inevitable depravity aligned with being a lonely person. I pray that I'm ordinary in my chronic loneliness. Still, ordinariness, <laughs> still, ordinariness seems so often laced with an unsanitary smell or a prickly mass at the back of the throat. I can't stand the thought of ordinariness inside, whether it's mine or belongs to a strange man making love to me. I think back to the men I've been inappropriately generous with and understand that each time I thought I was lucid, I was not. I've been so certain that the men I've cared for are extraordinary in how they inspire me to admire them. He's not like any boy I've met before. I smile to myself as I swivel in the balmy loveliness of the feeling. I seek sex, though I still cannot finish, likely needing to feel safer than I do to come. You can let go with me, nine months ago, Gabriel said watched me struggle to preserve my control as his body sheltered and broke down mine. Feels so nice when observed from above. Like myself best when overly trusting, enormous eyes and blank in the head. I seek sex, though I still cannot finish, overly conscious of what there is to lose when I let pleasure in too close. It feels so good. It could feel much more good. Let go and sleep stoned through the night. Let go and sleep stoned through the night. I can't. I burst to breathlessly come clean. I can't. It must be terror. I seek sex, though I am chest deep in terror. It is not so bad, submerged deep under my surface like beds of seagrass. Terror is calm as pink noise. You can let go with me, nine months ago, he'd said, likely knowing that I shouldn't. I didn't. Body wouldn't let me. It watches over me, though I haven't unlearned letting it down. I am looked out for and overwhelmed by it, and fastening and withholding as it pleases. You can let go with me. Wish he hadn't said so, but can't imagine anything greater to hear during sex. 
I repeat to myself that he didn't hurt me, but I slipped again. Left another voice message he won't say anything at all to. Giggling my way through it, but unable to keep the rifting splinters in my voice together. I wonder if he feels sad for me. It seems so plain. How persistently I try to obscure my hurt with amusing nonsense. Gabriel. None of it so much about him. Some unresolved pain I've carried forward, not at all his to solve. I am lonely, I am lost, I am fearful, I am growing up too far from home, I do not like to sleep alone, I can't stand being enjoyed than forgotten. None of it comes close enough to what I mean, sometimes none of it seems at all true, oftentimes it is a matter of being too honest. I repeat to myself that he didn't hurt me, he didn't, but I am lonely, I am lost, I am fearful, I am growing up too far from home, I do not like to sleep alone, I can't stand being enjoyed than forgotten. I've matured into an uneasiness that leaves me quieter as I get older, more serious and afloat in thought. Some days, every stupid pain seems benign. Like a funny dream, I'm glad to have felt something disproportionately large through. Others, they accumulate. I think of my rising slip-ups in intimacy and endure some nameless grief. I fall asleep most nights forgetting to turn off the lights. I graze my fingers against the white hairs in my belly to soothe myself making myself smaller and dreaming that I will not be so serious and afloat in thought tomorrow. I seek sex, though I still cannot finish, likely needing to feel safer than I do to come. I claim I don't know how to feel safe with a man, but mishandle my words. I feel safe with men with too much ease. I feel safer with men sooner than I should. I've hurried into sex before because I've always privately thought things will go far differently. I must hurry into sex now because I am disappointed and controlling. There's something doggedly romantic inside that exhausts me. It is, an, it is an inane attempt at keeping my hopes damp, some backward way of trampling out my girlish idealism. Hurried sex seeming like more forgiving ground to drop from than when things are done right and still come apart. Maybe I hurry into sex because I like so badly the sedating heat of palms impressed upon my stomach because I like to make someone feel well taken care of with the force of my yearning, because I like to get noisy and don't know where else it's okay to be so noisy, maybe because I love how long nighttime can outstretch when granted affection that fits right, finally soft and light, less full of ugly worry, when night makes reachless things feel near and simple for a little while. At night, it is easier to say what I mean as I mean it. I know I haven't done this right, but I would like to see you again and not be fearful that I am turning you away with my sincerity. I know I haven't done this right, but this felt nice. I'd like to feel this nice again. In the morning, I search for a way home in a neighborhood I don't know. I'm untidy and overexposed, somehow both upset and deeply settled by the dim sky. It's nice, thinking of little, it's nice, thinking of little beyond getting my body home. Thank you. There's a freshness when reading the poetry and short fiction of Hannah Dobrzycki. Uh, the freshness of uh, nightlife, the freshness of the lyricism of a slacker drawl, when I first read her poetry, it was sort of like re-encountering Ray Armentrout or John Ashbery reincarnated as a stoner. Um, this piece is called Psychoanalysis and Elegy. It is hard to remember what you are like. I mean, there are some obvious things. Very messy, thick hair much lighter than mine. David's little sister, that is what your friends with bandanas wrapped around their heads and basketball shorts called me. Childlike polos, you used to listen to the Marshall Mathers LP a lot. I remember that. It seemed like you and every white boy in America loved Lose Yourself and was singing like toy soldiers by the dirty pool. You had a poetic way of talking which surprised people, 
you turn a phrase into a rap lyric in an instant. And you were smart. That was what mom and all her friends said. I've always been the ever devoted, even though I am your sister four years younger. Mom would task me with finding you, calling your name when you'd walk off into the moonless night. And I don't know where you are now. Your voice goes from high to low so quickly. When you and I call, all I hear is your personality split, then waver and then flatline. It's not like you're dead or anything. Schizophrenia by Sonic Youth. That was the word I heard a lot between the doctors back then. Agoraphobia by Deer Hunter was also very good. And I know I can borrow mom's busted Toyota with its cool silver lining and drive down Interstate 90, where they have you now in Westchester, right? Make something behavioral health. It's what is best for David, was what they said. Of course, it's been over a year and I never do come visit you. I can barely talk to you without the screen of my own mental apparatus failing me and then drawing a blank. So here is my letter instead, because I can still see you, maybe seven years before all this. You are 13 and I am nine. You are sitting in the White House next door, screened in, lounging on the fraying bungalow's front porch, playing bullshit with all those kids who seemed even older than you. And I am the little sister, tasked with bringing you home. I rasp on the door, catch your eye, and then I can see your fear, that you have not earned this good way of American life, and that the performance of all this will soon fade as summer does. Here is the story I want to tell you, and I believe it was Nietzsche who coined the ter term eternal return. Nietzsche and Kundera after Nietzsche said that all our things, war, memories of war, are recurring like entangled solid masses. That once something happens, you are diagnosed, let's say. It keeps on happening when I'm at the bar, many years later, which suggests that you are here with me. I am sitting here at the Blue Rose Bar. It is Saturday and it is hot. The white noise is circulating at a low frequency in my left ear and I am writing this story as a part of you, wherever, whoever you are. This is the story of Sadie and I our digital addictions and love for the silver American screen. It began with Roy Orbison, his slow sonata that exists within the dream, within the dream, within the dream. That's what it felt like anyway, going to the movies two miles out each Saturday. We lived then in a town called Twin Lakes, Massachusetts, the Western region. You were in supervised care by them because it was getting too hard to manage. The constant threat of the worst case scenario, shrieks at night, anxiety frequencies above the safe maximum. And mom, ever the workaholic, got a job at an experimental teaching medical school. So we moved once they couldn't save you and took you away, a, li a little east of where we were. It was just mom, our golden retriever, Ron, and me. I loved mom's haggard beauty, the contortion of memory maps across her hands, the way she would sit down on the stoop of any building, open a newspaper and wait for us like a man. That is, when everyone like mom still read newspapers, you remember. When it got bad, you'd, you would rock back and forth and say you could not recall the past. So just in case, I will tell you. When we were younger, it was like I knew who mom was on the elementary school's front lawn, based on her blue jean shirts, medical ID pinned to the front breast pocket, a newspaper reliably poking out of her back pocket or reusable shoulder bag. Mom never married, which must have pissed you off. 
She was the last person to use a beeper. She remembered random facts about bridges, leaders of historical wars, grew up with hippies and got educated and went off to medical school to fight AIDS. And anyway, this wasn't like now when she would come home, go online, and refuse to talk to even me. Hold up, crouched over computer, after phone, more computer, reading the New York Times. But I remembered her nonetheless, no makeup, no purse, faint trail of Marlboro's, Mar maybe vodka at night. She was ever the cowboy, and she was the first person who taught me what it meant to be that good brand of American cool. It began with a look in the mirror, eyes that looked back, grateful for self-recognition, sort of gray like mom's eyes, sort of gray and blue. The Massachusetts air was thin ice, and it was silent. So we're sort of in this moment where poets are reinventing the prose poem. And the form of that reinvention is total flatness. And so it was so amazing to see that Laila Nadar was also reinventing the prose poem, but a more supple form that could be at once playful, furious, and sad, all of which are unexpected, except for the last one, emotions to deal with grief, uh, fantastical sonic world building about the underworld, death, and Osiris. Hi. I'd just like to say an enormous thank you to Professor Chen. Just, you've been wonderful for the past you know, year supporting us, so thank you. Um, so there are three characters, so Iris, Osiris, and the father. Iris, hands on shoulders, feet on knees, cheek to cheek, the wandering of a child around and about, inside and out of a mother's body, all that soft skin like bread batter, taking the imprints of footsteps for a moment before rising again, adapting. She will starve, eat, rest, run, anything for her child. Child, a jumble of limbs and a stumble of words, Home is the place with the four walls, two windows, and soft smell of something pine and dust. Mommy is where I come from, where I can crawl back into whenever home feels too big. Head on heart, limbs all around, soft sounds under ear, the familiar the dump, the dump, the dump of something hot and warm, melted wax running all over me until I'm drenched and exhausted by the love I feel for mommy. Only then do I surrender and sleep. Love is all I know to feel or say. Father is the shadow in the doorway. Father. Iris doesn't even know the word sorry yet, and yet, and yet, that's all I am. Not Baba, Papa, Dad, or Daddy, just sorry. She is half woman, half apology, a pitiful sphinx. Being, being observed when observation is not sympathy is just being tortured. As her earnest gaze falls upon me and sees all I am in three things, moist eyes, hurrying lips, heaving heart, she knew how to do this. Her hands weren't calloused and useless as mine are. She would be holding our girl right now, not sat across her. Hers were mother hands, comb, cloth, balm, safety. They knew a tender knack of tying sashes, fitting baby shoes, and stringing pretty words that make no sense, and kissing full sense into empty words, which things are corals to cut life upon. This is how children learn, not through the firm press of a man, but the touch of a woman, more a god. How did she teach our girl to become aware and unafraid of love? I'm so afraid. I'm so sorry. I could not lift my heavy heart to breathe till then, but then I raised it, and it fell in broken words all over her bedroom floor. With fear in my eyes, I pointed, I pointed my daughter to the mess all around her and named it death, and made her watch as I shoved all the broken shards of her love for her mother into its meaning. Osiris. Mother speaks the language of tracing fingers, reverent touches to cheek and chin, pads of thumb to lip and brow. Fresh out of water, the girl is wet and learning. Mother touches still on the eyelid. The girl giggles at the still point of the turning world. And the mother reprimands her to look. The girl tries to open her eyes, but mother becomes a weight, firm and pressing, telling her to look. 
The girl tries to open her eyes even harder, but it's like a fridge door that won't open, nails breaking under the handle. Look, 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 look. She's trying, she's crying, it's wet, it's dark, yet somehow she's still breathing. Keep looking, she cannot see. She wants to open her eyes now, she doesn't like the dark, she misses her mother. The floating stars, spirals, squiggles begin playing along the blackness. Light with your eyes closed is teasing nonsense, cruelty. She re realizes behind her eyes are hands, fingers, and nails. She's clawing and tearing until her fingers make purchase, and she drives her head through the gap. The girl wakes up, a crash from downstairs. It's still dark out. This will be her bad dream for many years. I wipe the crumbs from the corner of my mouth. The girl's asleep again, in the dream again. Her father is asleep in his room on his back. I decide to give him a taste of her medicine and sit on his eyes. Try and open them, I dare you. Your daughter's playing the same game in the next room, struggling with all her little life and all her little might a world over. Father doesn't stir. I stick my tongue between my teeth and readjust my bum, give a grunt, but nothing. I lift a brow that hasn't quivered in 13 summers, crack my knuckles, perform my tests, and rest a feather upon father's mouth. I plug his nose with muffled laughter in my collar. The father breathes, feather floats, when my quick finger shoves the feather down his open throat. I dust off my hands. He needed a bit more bird in him. And the unweaned child can't keep sucking at loss. Father gives a hearty cough in the morning. So uh, I asked Sarah Hilgis what I should say about Frankie Fierro, and Sarah made sure to emphasize that Frankie is very funny. Um, and Frankie is, in fact, was not one of my students in the workshop for seniors, but is one of my current students in my class about anti-colonial literature, where it's been great to hear her talk about the satiric impulses of uh, Sultana's dream, a Bengali feminist utopia, or uh, the politics related to land in Native American poetry. Um, I look forward to working with Frankie in the fall. Hello, Sarah, that was very kind, thank you. Um, so this is, this is an excerpt from a, a piece that I'm working on right now that's much longer, and I sort of just um, condensed it a little aggressively, um, so, it, so it has like a total arc. Okay. Other than the fact that we were all adopted from China, we had nothing in common. I was nerdy and wore outdated hand-me-down t-shirts. They all had smartphones while I was doomed to a phoneless existence, to a preteen, this was practically social suicide. When they took selfies with their Snapchat filters, I quietly left the room, preferring to be absent than the recipient of a half-hearted, oh, did you want to be in this? I also knew that they had more money than my family did despite us all coming from single mom households. Diane was the mom who invited us to her beach house on Long Beach Island every June. My mom met her through an organization called FCC, or Families with Children from China. FCC mostly consisted of educated, upper-class women determined to be good, white, adoptive parents. They, unlike some moms, would expose their, their daughters to other Chinese adoptees. They, unlike some moms, would not get offended if, during a tearful argument, their daughters screamed that they weren't their real parents. We had attended every beach weekend since I was a toddler. There were seven girls, I was the youngest. The oldest and I were nine years apart. While these gatherings served as a fun opportunity for our families to catch up, I could tell my mom held particular reverence for these trips. Perhaps the other moms, who were lawyers, and financial consultants were not particularly wooed by the promise of an all-expenses-paid weekend at someone's beach home. But when June rolled around each year, my mom would consult her calendar and announce, I'm hoping Diane sends out the LBI invite soon. To the moms, the age of their daughters was not relevant in their friendship with each other. They all seemed to pick up where they had left off the previous year with ease. For, our for the daughters, age dictated our existence that weekend. The oldest two were oldest by a large margin, so their friendship was a given. The same went for the middle pair, but that's where the neat age gaps ended, breaking down into a pair exactly of the same age, Emma and Noel, and someone one year younger, me. Some cruel law of friendship did not allow for Emma, Noel, and I to become a happy trio. 
I remember Emma and Noel bonding with comical swiftness, as if motivated by the thrill of excluding an undeserving member. Immediately, they built a language of friendship that I scrutinized each year, tracking every articulation of their closeness. For example, on the beach, Emma and Noel always shared a towel to sit on, despite the dozens of towels that Diane stored in their laundry room. While everyone else lounged in the sun independently, Emma and Noel would sit side by side, their thighs touching as they buried each other's feet in the sand. Their language grew more elaborate as we aged. In middle school, they moved on to creating complicated secret knocks through the door to their shared room. Unlike the rest of the daughters, Noel did not sleep in a guest room with her mom. Emma personally invited her to sleep in her bedroom, which was spacious and had access to the wooden wraparound deck. For my room, which shared a wall for, with Emma's, I could hear the muffled knocking sequences they were constantly practicing. At night, as I laid next to my mom, peacefully asleep, I would listen to their low conversations and laughter. I would strain my ears to make out what they were saying. Sometimes I stayed like this for hours, hoping to catch mention of my name, but of course I never did. The last time I went to Long Beach Island, I was 20. In the car, my mom told me that Chris, Noelle's mom, had passed away a few weeks ago from complications of skin cancer. So it would be really nice to say something to Noelle, your condolences, you know, if she's there, she said. I had known Chris was receiving last resort treatments throughout the year, but the news still came as a shock. I listened silently as my mom told me about how Noelle had recently moved on with her aunt. As I brushed my teeth that night, I heard Noelle coming up the stairs, and I quickly left the bathroom. She stood in front of Emma's closed door and knocked in a staccato sequence. Noelle? Emma appeared in the doorframe. Hey, is everything OK? Yeah, yeah, everything's good. I just, uh, I was wondering if this room was still open. At her side, I could see her index finger picking her thumb's cuticle. Of course, you can stay here, Emma said. I just didn't change your sheets, I'm sorry. Did you think that I didn't want to sleep with you? I didn't know if you were going to come this weekend. Yeah, well, Noelle said, stepping past Emma and into the room. It's rude to turn an orphan away. I stood for a while in a darkened hallway, hidden. I kept replaying the knock and how Emma had said Noelle as if summoned. It's been a curious and exciting process to see the growth and development of Lucy Narva's poetry, beginning as a devotee of Joy Graham and a cautious appreciator of language poetry. I feel like her writing occurs at the midpoint of lyric interiority and abstraction. Let's give her a hand. Hello. Is it too muffled with the mask? Or is it OK? OK, great. Amazing. I'm at like the end stage of a cold where you're just still congested. And I feel like for not worrying people, it's the right choice. OK, um, I have three. Yeah, I have three pieces I'm going to read. Um, the first one is called Swallowed. The morning after the hurricane, cotton sky. No trace except big water, opening like mouths, and I looked for you. I remember looking into the mouths for you, for what I could become in the foam. The mouths were open, and I wanted them wider, wanted a god or the drama of the night before by the house on the dock. Soaked through with the thickness of the rain, settled, warm. Watched the same mouths attempt to swallow the shore, Sound alone was nearly enough to make this body follow, something in it wanting to be thrown like that. To be small and held between the rain and tide brought into the way of things. I remembered a myth I once heard, no rain over the ocean. It started somewhere, perhaps from fear of excess, that more of something good. If I had found you, how could you have blamed me? I never learned to be sparing, only to listen closely. More, I wanted it, and still, more, there, in that water, into water, its soft impact. Okay, this piece is called Closure. 
A last room, chairs around a jaw fallen violently open. A rasp, air sending thorns into flatter air. It is Thursday, which it wasn't when it was Sunday, trying to rain. And between wet, gasping breaths, he was or was not listening. It is Thursday, maybe also on the movie screen, in the room with the rasp slit into rainless silence. What to tell you? I watch hands that know how to say goodbye and hands that feel it. Um, okay, this last piece is like very much in progress and doesn't have a title, but there's this quote I really love that's kind of floated either in or around all the iterations of it so far, so I'm gonna read it. It's uh, from Atel Adnan's book, Seasons. Oh please, nature is no metaphor, but the origin of itself. This is how it really goes. Drove up the coast as the trees changed. Watched the end of the carrot sweet bloom, August's neck dry, cracked like kindling, and out the window, bright sky. Then it's black needles, mute, limbless, still offering. No leaves they just kept offering. Thousands layered the hills, naked. I was there, in a way, and shamefully. Saw too much of them. Saw and knew the distance between myself and their finite bodies. Thank you. <laughs> So something totally surprising that happened with reading Eliana Smith's work throughout the semester was something that is really rare and revelatory in a creative writing workshop, is seeing a writer become completely surprised by their own work, characters, and imagination. And I think all of us were blown away by the way that Eliana's own characters and their psychodynamics actually took control of her stories and changed what would happen to them within the narrative. Her work, were, there were stories of internalized racism, shame, but as this trajectory I'm showing also shows, there are also a story about the meaning of the unconscious. Hello, um, I will be reading an excerpt from a piece I'm currently working on. It is called The Stomach Can Scream. It started as a stomach ache. Three days into my high school graduation trip to Barcelona, I felt a dull pain in my lower abdomen. I assumed it was constipation. Thus far, our trip had consisted of eating endless amounts of pizza, pasta, paella, and just about everything in sight. My friends were loving the Spanish food and lifestyle, so I, as usual, refrained from mentioning my discomfort. Just drink a lot of water, and that will flush everything out, my mom assured me on the phone while I was doubled over in pain on the bathroom floor of our Airbnb. I did as she said, but the lack of instant results scared me, so I bought a pack of laxatives from the pharmacy. Almost instantly, my body released the compacted carbs and sugar from my digestive tract. It felt like everything came out, but somehow the pain remained. After another week of high water and laxative intake, my stomach pain not only increased, but physically started to swell. The bloating was discouraging, considering the number of low-rise bottoms and super crop top combinations I had packed for the summer. Every morning, I'd wake up hoping that somehow everything would go back to normal. But each time I worked up the courage to stand in front of the mirror and turn to the side, a bowling ball-sized mass extended from my stomach. Are you sure you're not pregnant? My friend joked. It had been 12 days of pain and bloating. I downplayed the discomfort and dragged myself along the nine to five itinerary. We bounced from buses to boats cathedrals to museums, and our nighttime clubbing was just as taxing. The 90 degree June heat was an added shove in the back. I reached a breaking point on our hike to Park Guo. My friends, tipsy off Aperol spritzes, cheered at the orange sky and took selfies atop the vibrantly colored architecture. By the time I made it, 
the sky had dimmed into a hazy blue. My stomach pounded incessantly, like a fetus had learned to kick. I ran my hands alongside the infamous wavy banister and picked at a neon yellow tile. I imagined using the sharp edge to make an incision beneath my belly button. What would come out? Honey, I think it's time you go see a doctor, my mom whispered over the phone. By that point, I was calling her two times a day, and I desperately urged her to keep her voice down out of fear that my friends would hear. Though I had grown comfortable rejecting the planned activities, I made up different excuses each time, hungover, tired, scared of being pickpocketed, etc. Something about my stomach pain felt inexplicably real and imagined. The word stomach ache didn't cover its severity. How could I expect my friends to validate it when I couldn't even understand it myself? I secretly returned to the pharmacy and asked to speak with someone. After a frustrating conversation, I was finally introduced to a doctor who spoke no English. I could see in his eyes that he immediately labeled me as foreign. I assumed at the time that this was due to my strong American accent. He haphazardly listened and scribbled down my symptoms and then asked to perform an exam. His cold hands passively pressed on my stomach for about 10 seconds. I wondered what he was looking for. Madame, you have IBS, he enunciated each letter slowly. He handed me a packet of supplements. The only word I could decipher was yeast. Thank you. I smiled with relief and he uncomfortably left the room. That night, I spent an hour researching IBS. I hoped it was something specific, non-serious, and easily cured. IBS is none of those things. That Googling session was the first time I cried about my situation. 10 days later, there was still no improvement. The yeast supplement tasted like dog food, and I couldn't force myself to choke it down anymore. One night, I lay on top of the sheets of my twin XL bed. It was so hot I opened the window, but only more hot air poured in. I took off my sleeping shirt, which had become my everyday shirt since it was the only one that covered my entire torso, and stared at my stomach. It was so distended that not even laying on my back diminished its curvature. My belly button filled with sweat until it overflowed and drops slowly slid down the sides of my stomach dissolving into the bedsheet beneath me. My stomach was crying. I closed my eyes and placed the palm of my hand on top of the wetness. What is wrong with you? I spoke to it directly. No response. Do I need to go home? I felt the word yes shake through my body. Call it God, intuition, or following my gut. My body was speaking to me. Thank you. <laughs> So um, one thing uh, I've heard students say is, you know, I come to college and now I can read in Middle English and read about Chaucer writing about butts and I can know the meanings of words like jouissance and différence. But what language do I use when I go home and have to talk to my mother and father? So when reading Andy Tappenden's work, there is wit and melancholy, but I think what's most important is there is a loyalty to the vernacular, and I think that's very honorable. Hello. Um, I think I'm gonna read four poems. Uh, this first poem is pretty short. My dad is from Northern Ontario, um, and this is analogies for my dad's French. Honey off the lip of a mouth full of bees. Man wearing a coat under his skin. Winter as a metaphor and then not a metaphor. Winter that you wear in your hip like a holster. Bus leaving hours before sunset. Bed in the basement. Northern lights in the past tense. The sky always only half there. The Ritz diner. Language as a hand gripping the edge of a cliff. Snow without romance. No romance without snow. Hands permanently cold. Every story in the body. The broken skidoo. The car with no candle all told over the soft cushion of a red dancing tongue. Um, 
This poem is called, There's Some I Can't Say Goodbye To. The boys I would race at the park, or my freshman year RA, whose torso had a tattoo of an orange slice, and who gave a group of us his room to watch the democratic debate, even though the election was next year. I was so sure back then of electoral politics and the inherent goodness of people, and that night was one of the first times I saw her, but not really, but a part of her, the best part, engaged in a conversation like nothing mattered more, and not yet sitting next to me, not yet a person who follows me into every room until there is no such thing as a new place, just another place, not yet knowing anything about each other, and I was still convinced of people's goodness except maybe my own, and already there were people I remember so that others can forget, or at least that's what I hope. Like on every shot glass, I write the name of my grandfather so my mother doesn't have to. Isn't that the point of memory to turn the dull ache into some kind of comfort? Um, this poem is called Barton Pond Reveals Itself to Me. On the subway, a song about heat takes me to summer. Two years ago, driving in a car of moving air to coach on fake grass. When I get there, half the girls are afraid of the hard-shelled cicadas and their endless trill. The other half scooping the bugs tenderly off their teammates' backs like a melon baller whispering against the rind. I'm never sure of my instructions, but that's besides the point. The sport is surviving summer until I can meet Zoe at the river, which is called a pond and not on any digital maps. And by this point, I've deteriorated, deteriorated my arm muscles, which is, I guess, less a decision than the absence of one, which I have gotten very good at. But I dive in anyways, imperfectly. And when I'm tired of aiding my own float, Craving the dry wood of the dock like a suture to a wound, I let Zoe grab my wrists and pull the river out of me. While I on the subway, thinking about warmth that loosens limbs, Zoe is in another country planning her future, and the blanket in my room is always cold, no matter who gave it to me. OK, and this last poem is called Myrtle Beach Memoir. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I said it like that. Okay, Myrtle Beach Memoir. <laughs> um, <laughs> she keeps opening the window shade, and I don't know how to close it. It turns out there's nowhere you can go that isn't here. It's in a bare room with too much sun and no corners. I am always looking for photos of when I was in Montreal and secretly wanting a sunburn on my face. I think these days red is my color, and I can't drink too much or else I end up outside with no shoes on, crying, or talking in a bed with a girl I'm afraid of in the way that these days there's only one girl, and she's everywhere. In the bed with the girl who could be anyone, if there wasn't only one girl, we talk about the knowledge you have underneath the knowledge you've learned, like the first is a ball of light that the second is constantly filtering. These days, which are never these days, I am preoccupied with my most simple tasks, cutting fruit into pieces and eating each chunk with two hands, washing dishes as soon as I'm done with them, as if there is no sink, only water. In the South, all my metaphors get aquatic, and I feel like a fish who does not understand glass, only walls where there are no walls. Thank you. So I, I want to do a shout out to four student writers who are fulfilling the true vocation of a writer, which is being completely antisocial and not reading. So I'm just going to say the name of four concentrators who are not part of the reading, and at the end we can clap for them. Um, Madison Cousy, Sophie Larson, Jude Poli, and Manola Torres. So let's support our I guess in conclusion, I, I want to say that I think one experience of being a writer, especially when after you leave college, is that it can sometimes be an experience of feeling disempowered, that there's some famous writer out there who's already published, your friend already got this internship, which incidentally doesn't pay anything, but you don't care. Um, so you might feel like you're perpetually behind, but I hope one thing you got out of this reading or from workshops you've taken here is that you are each other's power. So what I recommend is, you know, before you graduate or before you leave tonight, make sure to connect with a writer friend of yours, start a reading series, create your own zine, uh, 
trade work in someone's living room and uh, maintain your literary friendships. Um, so let's give another hand to all of the writers and thank you so much. <laughs>